Welcome to a world where nothing is as it seems. Welcome to fake Britain. Behind your back now. Here at the Fake Britain House, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous, and we'll help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, the fake life saving equipment that got into the NHS. This will break under any serious pressure. Life lost. The fake cigarettes hidden right under our noses. It was reinforced. When you see what was in the back of the van, you can see why. The fake cashmere that could contain rat fur. Imagine rat fur around your head. It just doesn't bear thinking about. And the chilling story of the fake ice cream vans. The quality of workmanship was shocking. Potentially a safety hazard going down the road. Here on Fake Britain, we're constantly amazed at the lengths the fakers will go to to make money. Look at this. It's a combat application tourniquet used on patients who have a very real risk of dying through blood loss. They're carried by the military, the police and also ambulance crews. It may not look like much, but it could be the difference between life and death. This one, though, won't be saving any lives. It's highly dangerous because it doesn't work. It's a fake. And alarmingly, fakes like this have found their way into the NHS. Every single ambulance trust across the country has one of these critical pieces of life-saving equipment. It's a combat application tourniquet, or CAT. Paramedics use the tourniquets to save lives during the Alton Towers roller coaster disaster. This was one of the worst accidents ever on a theme park ride, leaving 16 people injured, including Leah Washington, whose left leg was badly crushed in the accident. Because I was so injured on ride, I needed their skills to save my life, really. So I was literally just bleeding to death, and these tourniquets helped stop the bleeding. The main artery in Leah's leg was completely severed in the accident. X-rays taken at the time show where paramedics had to apply two cat tourniquets to stop her from bleeding to death. You can see on one of the pictures of my left thigh how much pressure they're actually putting onto my leg. There's two darker shades, um, and that's where the two tourniquets were, and it's quite shocking, really, when you look how tight it is. It looks simple, but the combat application tourniquet has a patented design that makes it reliable and simple to use in an emergency. The tourniquets are made by Fenton Pharmaceuticals. Managing director Graham Hill showed us how they work. Here we have a simulated gunshot wound to the thigh, and applying the tourniquet is easy. Take the tourniquet, put it on above the point of bleeding, tighten up, put through the buckle, and then tighten the windlass as required until the bleeding stops. The tourniquets can be bought online by first aiders, mountaineers and machine operators. In fact, anyone who might need one in their emergency medical kit. And they're used by paramedics across the country to save the lives of people injured in road accidents. Genuine tourniquets are rigorously tested and designed to be strong. A tourniquet is not a, I might put this on, it's, I need to put this on or my casualty will die. And therefore, it has to work first time, every time. Since being introduced, the tourniquets have sold in their thousands. But now, there are fakes on the market. I was at a trade show and I was approached by a Chinese gentleman and he said, I've got something on my booth that I'd like to show you. And he very proudly showed me a very poor uh, copy of the cat tourniquet and tried to sell it to me. 
The tourniquet on offer was a fake version of the genuine patented combat application tourniquet and was even being sold under the trademarked cat name. It did have a CE mark on it. Uh, when I challenged uh, the Chinese gentleman about the CE mark, he said, yes, that, that stands for Chinese export. The CE mark is a safety mark that shows a product complies with European safety legislation. But the CE mark on the fake cat tourniquet was also fake, put on to fool buyers into thinking the tourniquet had been safety tested. I couldn't be more concerned about the fact that there are fake cat tourniquets out there. Nobody is going to use a cat tourniquet unless they really need to in extremis. And that is not the time to have a device fail. Genuine cat tourniquets have been engineered to withstand the extreme pressure they're put under when they're fully tightened to stop blood loss. Pull it through like the Velcro and then turn the windlass very, very tight. On the real tourniquet, it's designed to flex a certain amount so that it won't break. But how do the fake tourniquets hold up in an emergency? The risk of the windlass bar breaking here on the fake. There you go. You can see how easy that was to break. Andy Collin is a consultant paramedic with over 20 years' experience in the ambulance service, during which time he saved the lives of dozens of serious trauma victims. Patients that are badly injured, blood loss is one of the major uh, causes of death. So, of course, you have blood in your body. Uh, it's best to keep that blood inside your body, uh, and devices like the tourniquet help us to do that. We showed Andy how a fake tourniquet might perform in an emergency situation. Wow, the handle snaps very easily uh, on the fake one. It's really quite alarming. The last thing you want to have happen to your patient is equipment fail. Uh, particularly if that failure can lead to a, a really bad outcome uh, for patients. So, uh, you know, I'm pretty stunned and shocked uh, with what I've seen, and uh, I really hope that uh, we don't see these fake products out there on the streets. Fake tourniquets like these are available for sale online. At Fenton Pharmaceuticals, it's Andrew Saunders' job to scour the internet and identify the fakes before anyone gets hurt. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven of the ten tourniquets for sale on this site are fake. And you can tell by the price, they're so much cheaper than the genuine article. But fakes aren't just being sold in small batches online. During filming, Fenton Pharmaceuticals made an astonishing discovery. Fake tourniquets had penetrated the NHS supply chain, potentially putting hundreds of lives at risk. One of my colleagues had a meeting with the Scottish NHS, the Special Operations Response Team, and this particular tourniquet was brought out, and my colleague immediately saw it and said, that is a fake cat. The Scottish NHS team had inadvertently bought 2,000 fake tourniquets. Paramedics could have gone out in ambulances equipped with fake life-saving equipment. You can just imagine the scene where their response vehicles are driving around, they get called to a job, they go to work to save the life, and the device breaks and the patient dies. Fenton Pharmaceuticals was concerned about other fake tourniquets being out there, and so they issued a press release urging organisations to check whether their combat application tourniquets were for real. The response was shocking. We very quickly started receiving phone calls from a number of organisations who have purchased fake cats and issued them to their staff. The National Ambulance Service of Ireland and ERS Medical, one of the largest independent ambulance services in the country supplying vehicles and staff to the NHS, both inadvertently bought fake non-compliant cat tourniquets which could have ended up in ambulances. Graham Hill showed us some samples that had been sent in. As soon as we received these, we were able to verify very, very quickly that they were fake. You can actually see quite easily that they're all different.
ERS Medical told us that they bought the products in good faith, but it was clear they were substandard and not fit for purpose. These items were immediately replaced and no patients were affected. They say they since been made aware that they had inadvertently purchased patent infringing products. All those who bought fake cat tourniquets have recalled and replaced them. No patients have been affected, but Graham fears more fakes may still be out there. This will break under any serious pressure. And if these are all over the UK in ambulances, and potentially that's a life lost, I'll have a go. Life lost. The trade in counterfeit and illegal cigarettes in this country is estimated to cost the government more than £2 billion in lost revenue and the battle between the criminals and HM revenue and customs is going on every day. Fake Britain's been to Manchester on a special HMRC operation to discover the extraordinary lengths the fakers will go to to hide their illegal stashes and carry on their trade. This morning, a major operation is underway to crack down on sellers of fake cigarettes. Andy Milliken from HMRC is leading the operation. The area that we're visiting today has often been described as the counterfeit capital of the UK. Lots of the agencies have had various problems over the last few years, including HMRC. We've got intelligence to indicate that there are illicit sales of tobacco in and around the area. Andy's team already knows the length that sellers of fake cigarettes will go to to conceal their illegal merchandise. In the bottom of wheelie bins, fake cupboards, and that's the reason that we brought the, um, the dog with us today. Hopefully, but the dog is going to sniff out all these ingenious hiding places. Today, the team has information there's a new type of hiding place for fake cigarettes, one they've never seen before, and it's somewhere in this car park. They think that cars are being used like mobile safes, out of sight, securely locked and quickly movable. If there's any trouble, they can be driven away with the fake goods safely inside. The uh, tobacco dog looking for indicators of tobacco products. He's methodically going around the car park and he's going to check every single vehicle and we'll see what they turn up when officers get to them uh, and actually get into the vehicles and search them. And it's not long before the dogs sniff out something of interest. The uh, tobacco dog has indicated that there's probably products in there. There's another one just further down. With a number of cars now under suspicion, it's time to see what's behind closed doors. Finally, their efforts are rewarded. This is the car that was indicated by the search dog. And there is a quantity of cigarettes in there. There's also a quantity of... Uh, of cannabis that we found in the boot along with dealer bags. So I suspect that uh, the person using this to store the, the drugs and the ciggies in, yeah. It appears this car is more than just a runaround for its owner. My colleagues have just found an example here, two packets of what we suspect to be um, illicit tobacco products, which will be non-juicy paid. This is kind of representative and a sample of the type of to illicit tobacco product that HMRC is interested in today. The car park is being used as a stockroom for nearby shops where the fake cigarettes are being sold. In one of the shops, the team has found even more suspected fakes. Packet Mayfair here, probably counterfeit. That's uh, L&M. We suspect that that, well, that's not for the UK market. Simple as that. Fake cigarettes may contain even more dangerous chemicals than genuine ones, and some don't self-extinguish, meaning they could cause house fires. Many fakes look so convincing that they can be hard to identify, but having seen so many over the years, Andy knows what to look for. It's the markings, really. You can see by some of the print, we'll get those, those formally checked when, uh, when we get back to the office. Back in the car park, the tobacco dogs have found another vehicle thought to contain tobacco. We've gained access to the boot and there, uh, as you can see, looks to be a substantial amount of ha um, hand rolling tobacco in, which probably, we suspect, is counterfeit. I don't know how many, tens and tens of packets are in there. So that's obviously going to be seized. When the car's been fully searched, the enormous size of the hall becomes clear. From a public health point of view, we would have concerns about where this has come from and, and what dangerous chemicals may be in it. The evidence is mounting.
and nearby the officers have spotted a green van parked up that they'd like to take a closer look at. Yeah, this unassuming vehicle is actually a heavily fortified mobile safe. It's the most secure the officers have seen so far. Just like a real safe, very hard to crack. As you can see, we're trying to gain entry to it at the minute. So what we're just doing is we're just going to call for some assistance and, uh, and make sure we get entry to it. The owner of the vehicle clearly doesn't want anyone getting inside. Someone else want to go? <laughs> After a battle with the door, the van is eventually forced to give up its secrets, and it's clear why it was so securely locked. So what we've got here, opening this, um, is what we suspect to be counterfeit illicit tobaccos. Obviously, several thousand in there. Um, there's two of these, which we've just extracted from the back of this van that was clearly reinforced to uh, prevent HMRC officers gaining easy access to it. The van was being used to store a huge number and variety of different tobacco products. Cheapers. Well, bit of a Pandora's box here. The different fake cigarette brands just keep coming. Excellence. And coming. Regals. Gold Classics. Oh, a real mix. I don't think we've seen these before. The team is surprised by the range of fakes they've found and the lengths to which the criminals have gone to hide them. Whose ever van this was, um, they've obviously been determined to make sure that we're not going to break into it easily. I think the fact that it was reinforced says everything, really. When you see what was in the back of the van, you can see why. I mean, there's a substantial amount of suspected illicit tobacco here. So, for HMRC, it's a good result. It's clear that these criminals are making huge profits. This is one of the vehicles that we broke into earlier, found a substantial amount of hand-rolling tobacco in the boot. The officers have just now finished a search of the vehicle, but in the glove box we've found some cash, which is approximately £2,000, um, so we're going to seize that under the Proceeds of Crime Act. The financial gains for the fakers are a huge loss for everyone else. These are suspected to be costing the UK economy about £2.1 billion every single year. Um, but as a result of the operation that we've done here today and the type of thing HMLC does, um, we've halved the illicit trade market in, in recent years. Sellers of fake cigarettes thought they could get away with hiding their stock inside their cars, but it's backfired. Now they'll lose not only their goods, but the cars too and they haven't seen the last of the authorities. Today isn't a one-off. These type of actions by HMRC and our partners take place all over the country, week in and week out. Uh, and, and, and we want to send a strong message to the public that we are actively cracking down on this kind of counterfeit and fraud. And it's not just HMRC that's seizing fake goods across the country. Coming up, we go behind closed doors with trading standards for an exclusive look at the fakes they've seized in just one year. This can actually lead to severe health problems like blindness and can even cause a heart attack. Do you like my jumper? Well, wait till you take a look at the label. 100% cashmere. Cashmere is one of the finest, softest, most luxurious fibres known to man. And not surprisingly, it costs a small fortune. Hundreds of pounds for a jumper like this. But if you spent that sort of money on it, you would have been fleeced. Because despite what the label says, it's not 100% cashmere at all. It's not any amount of cashmere. It's a fake. Here on Fake Britain, we've seen trading standards and the police seize a lot of fake clothes. Wherever you look, Adidas. It's standard fare for the fakers, whether it's designer labels, the latest sportswear or outdoor gear. If someone's buying it, the fakers are supplying it. Now the sellers of fake clothes have their sights on high-end fabrics. Fake Britain recently received a package from a member of the public. Inside were two sweaters, branded as Polo Ralph Lauren. The label said they were both 100% cashmere, but the person who bought them was suspicious. So, we decided to investigate. First, we went to meet former BBC television presenter, Selena Scott. 
After seeing the rising demand for cashmere amongst the British public, she opened an ethical cashmere business from her farm in Yorkshire. When I worked on breakfast television many years ago, I, uh, I used to wear cashmere in the morning because it was easy. And the cashmere jumpers I bought then, nearly 30 years ago, I still have. And they're still as good as new. Selena's cashmere has stood the test of time because it's high quality, genuine cashmere that comes from the fluffy undercoats of cashmere goats like these. Cashmere is one of the softest fibres in the world, and it's not cheap. 100% cashmere garments can retail for hundreds of pounds each, so it's no surprise that fakers want some of the profits. Because cashmere's got this reputation on the world market as being one of the, the most luxurious goods you can possibly buy, there's room for corruption. It's thought the market is being flooded with fake cashmere that's labelled as cashmere when it's anything but. It might contain only small amounts of cashmere, with the rest made up of much cheaper fibres. When you see cashmere in warehouses, you can see how a crafty middleman will go along and say, we can mix that with something like yak. It looks similar, you put it in, mix it all up, and then marked 100% cashmere. Some cashmere is even labelled as 100% cashmere when it contains no cashmere fibres at all. But in some cases, the fibres have been revealed to be something that would make your skin crawl. In Italy, the authorities uncovered a huge business selling fake cashmere garments that contained rat fur. 14 people were arrested and more than a million fake items were seized. You hear about rat fur being mixed up with cashmere. I mean, imagine putting that on you. Imagine, you know, wrapping that round your head and uh, going off and uh, it, it just doesn't bear thinking about. We wanted to see how easy it might be to buy fake cashmere. So we went to an online retailer and bought a scarf advertised as 100% cashmere for around £30. The sort of price some high street shops sell the fabric for at the lower end. We then took the scarf to cashmere industry expert James Sugden, here surrounded by genuine cashmere. I've been nervous about it. The finish that I would look at is very clean. There's not much top surface to it, which is generally characteristic of cashmere. 100% cashmere. Yes, well, I would be very suspicious. If it was cashmere, I would expect it to be rather more luxurious than this. James suspects our cashmere scarf might not contain any of the luxury fibre at all. With cashmere costing up to ten times the price of wool, it's little wonder that some criminals are making a business out of passing off cheaper fabrics as something of much higher quality. The temptation for a manufacturer in China to dilute or uh, tamper with a blend is considerable because the rewards uh, in terms of the value of putting some other fibre with cashmere is considerable. There's only one way to find out if our scarf and the sweaters sent in by one of our viewers are actually made of cashmere. We need to get them tested. So today we've brought all the garments to textile and fibres expert Dr Phil Greaves. He'll examine clippings of the clothing under a powerful microscope to see what they're really made of. First, he looks at the scarf. In order to test the scarf and see which fibres are present, I need to shred fibres into short lengths and spread them out on a slide. Cashmere fibres should look like this, with a very particular pattern of ribs and scales on the outside, and that's what James is looking for. But under the microscope, our scarf's true nature is soon revealed. I'm finding wool and silk. I'm not finding any cashmere. Those are the only two fibres I can find. Most of these fibres are smooth. Fake Britain has managed to buy fake cashmere. The label said 100% cashmere, so that's what you'd expect it to be made of. But there's no cashmere in it. Next, Dr Greaves tests the two jumpers that were sent in by a fake Britain viewer. Under the microscope, it's not looking good. I can tell it's not cashmere, it's not an animal fibre, it's a man-made fibre. The garment is made of 100% acrylic, there's no cashmere in there at all. All three of the items, described as 100% cashmere, contain absolutely no cashmere whatsoever. 
and Ralph Lauren confirmed that they did not make the two jumpers. The labels were fake. We showed the results to James Sugden. I travel the world, I travel the markets, I look all the time at garments, I'm constantly touching and feeling garments, and I see this, and it really incenses me, because what's at stake here is an industry, there's a jobs at stake, it's the integrity of the industry, and it's something that we shall go on fighting for, because this has to be stopped. We took to the streets to see what shoppers thought of our fake cashmere. Wow, so this is fake cashmere? I will never say it's not cashmere. If you're telling me no. it's cashmere, I'll be like, OK, cool, it's cashmere. Yeah. It could be a completely fake label, uh, but I would have been taken in by the label, I believe. I don't like lies. I don't like being told something that it's not. It kind of makes you think within the market as well how many of those clothes are actually cashmere when it yeah. says when it, it says, says it's are. cashmere but it's not. I think it's pretty appalling. Um, someone's obviously going to pay a little bit more for it, thinking mm. they're getting a special present for someone of themselves. They might have saved up for it, um, and they've just been left shortchanged. For people like Selena, who are in the cashmere business, the fakes are bad news all round. It's a con. It's a scam. That's all it is. It's not good for the consumer. It's certainly not good for the herder. So fake cashmere altogether is just a no-no. That is the sound of summer. A local ice cream van announcing its arrival for lots of hot and happy customers. I've got mine already, and this is real. Selling ice creams from a van can be good business, but the vans themselves are also big business. A new one costs around 60 grand, so it's no surprise the fakers want a scoop of the profits. Yes, believe it or not, they've even been faking our beloved ice cream vans. Have you bought your cone from a con van? It's a sound that transports many of us back to our childhoods. The music from an ice cream van that'll serve up a Mr Whippy, Cornetto, or whatever else takes your fancy. There are now around 5,000 ice cream vans like this across the country, putting smiles and ice cream on our faces. Around 90% of them are built by just one British company, Whitby Morrison of Crewe. The company was founded back in 1962 by Brian Whitby. From humble beginnings, the company is now the largest manufacturer of ice cream vans in the UK, and it employs around 50 workers. Uh, I'll add on to this one, but she's ready. Whitby Morrison is a family affair, with Brian Whitby's son Stuart and grandson Ed now behind the wheel. From 1960, classic British heritage to the modern fleet that people use today. It's just ice cream vans. We, we love them. And this is their flagship van, the Mondial. Bristling with technology, it has a distinctive fiberglass shell built onto a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter van chassis. This one's due to go beginning next week. Managing director Stuart is proud of what the company's achieved. I joined the company in 1978, and basically I set out to build the Rolls-Royce of ice cream vans. That's what we were about. And Whitby Morrison is renowned as the very best fans out there. We just want to do simply the best. All in all, it sounds like a great British manufacturing success story. And business was going brilliantly, until the day operations manager Ed was visited by some new customers. Six, 60 years old. We were contacted uh, by a customer suggesting that they'd like to purchase the Mondial, uh, our most popular model by a long, long way. Uh, he came to see us, placed the order, and thought, great, that's another one to add to the schedule and a great opportunity to produce another fantastic van. With a brand new Mondial ice cream van costing over £60,000, the customers wanted to save money by providing their own van for Whitby Morrison to convert into one of their own unique fiberglass designs. They brought a Mercedes panel van for us to convert, which is a, a big job. It's fiberglass body, refrigeration, all sorts of work involved. And we built it, as we do, and they came along a couple of times and checked it during build, and they took it away to Leeds. But not long after the clients left with their new van, Stuart and Ed began to hear some dark rumours about the true nature of their new customers. We were tipped off by a couple of people within the industry saying, you do know that these people are looking to purchase this van with a view to producing their own copies. I thought, ah, it can't be possible. 
So we approached the customer about it, invited them in for a meeting, and said, look, we've, we've heard these rumours, we wouldn't, wouldn't expect that to be the case. Oh, no, 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 we, we, we wouldn't do anything of the kind. We're just humble ice cream men. We just want to sell ice cream. But soon, Ed began to receive some worrying photographs of ice cream vans for sale on social media. We began to receive images from the various people within the industry. It turned out that these images we being posted were a blatant copy of a, a Whitby Morrison van. Whitby Morrison are all for a bit of healthy competition, but not when it comes to the faking of their vans. So they hired leading intellectual property lawyer Patrick Tedstone. In our business, you see all kinds of fake manufacture undertaken. But I don't think we'd ever seen something manufactured as a fake as large as these ice cream vans were. Patrick started to investigate how vans that looked very much like Whitby Morrison vans were being sold on social media. The primary method that the fakers had to sell these vans was people were invited to join chat rooms to look at vans and to place orders. The next step was to find out where the ice cream vans were being made. So Patrick put together a team to track down the fakers. When we got there, we could see lots of activity, ice cream vans coming and going, and work going on. And uh, we were really surprised by the uh, level of the uh, operation. The surveillance team kept a close eye on the premises, hoping to gather evidence that would prove that Whitby Morrison vans were being faked. A car was parked across the street and fitted with hidden cameras. But one day, the car went missing. There was just some glass on the pavement. We didn't know what had happened. The car turned up four days later, it had been trashed, the cameras were stolen, all the equipment was taken. We don't know who damaged the car, but it seemed like we had a real fight on our hands. We had to be careful what we were doing, we had to be cautious about our approach, but we needed more information. Patrick's investigation team turned to photographic evidence to continue building their case. Fortunately, we had a private investigator on the scene and he took some detailed photographs. From that moment onwards, we could tell this was an exact copy. But how had the fakers done it? Creating the fiberglass shell of an ice cream van is a highly specialised job, and Whitby Morrison have worked hard to make sure their vans are safe. This is the beginning of uh, the production process. This is the, the fiberglass moulding workshop. This is where all the vehicle bodies begin, uh, lids, doors, water tanks. Fiberglass is poured into special moulds that give the van its final shape. A mould can take over six months and cost tens of thousands of pounds to develop from scratch. It's much easier and cheaper to copy one, even if there is no guarantee that they'll be as safe as the originals. And that's just what the fakers did. This is the, the Mondial mould um, that was, was copied by the defendants. Every little detail was copied. You see the, the veins within the side, the recesses at the rear for the number plate, for the lights, within the roof, the space for the ventilation, the styling features. The fakers had copied the original Whitby Morrison design to the nearest millimeter. This is the most blatant example um, of one of the fake components. Absolutely everything here is was reproduced identically, from, from the leatherette pattern to the number of diamonds featured down the center. But the fakers hadn't just copied the design of the genuine Whitby Morrison vans. They even cashed in on the famous Whitby Morrison name. But when you combine the copying and you use the real manufacturer's name, then you're giving the product cachet and value, both in the new market and in the second-hand market. And what these defendants were doing, beyond any doubt, was they were saying, this is a Whitby Morrison van. The fakers were doing a roaring trade, selling the vans as fast as they could make them. We have evidence that the defendants sold at least 30 fake vans. That equates to up to £2 million of fake vans sold. £2 million is a huge amount of money, even for a successful manufacturer like Whitby Morrison's to bear. It wasn't just huge financial loss that Ed and Stuart Whitby had to contend with. There were real concerns about the safety of the fake vans out there. The fiberglass panels of an original Whitby Morrison van are rigorously safety tested. They're made to an approved European standard. 
And it was when one concerned customer contacted Whitby Morrison that the true danger of the fake ice cream vans became apparent. We had one van back here that had been built by, by the defendants and the quality of workmanship was shocking, you know, potentially a safety hazard going down the road. Patrick finally had enough evidence to bring a high court civil case against the Rubani family, who'd been selling the fake ice cream vans through their company, Yorkshire Specialist Vehicles. The judge presiding over the case wanted to see the fakery with his own eyes. When you looked at the vans side by side, they were so obviously identical, there was no way out for the defendants. They couldn't deny it any longer. They had to admit what they'd done. The court ruled that Yorkshire specialist vehicles had infringed the design and trademark of Whitby Morrison. They were ordered to pay £300,000 and to return the moulds they'd used to make the fake vans. But that didn't happen. This is what was returned. Uh, they told the court that the van had been stolen uh, and had been burnt out by a third party. Uh, all we can say is that the engine from the van had been removed and the expensive ice cream machinery had also been removed before it was burnt out. Uh, we don't know what the truth was. Since the court case, Whitby Morrison have agreed to work with ice cream sellers who bought fake vans by issuing them licenses that make the vans legitimate. They've also managed to get hold of the moulds that were used to make the fakes. Today, they're being destroyed to make sure no fake ice cream vans can ever serve another ice cream. Earlier on Fake Britain, we saw how HMRC, Trading Standards and the police are making major seizures of fake goods in Manchester. Looks to be a substantial amount of counterfeit illicit tobaccos. And we've seen how Trading Standards in other parts of the country are seizing fake goods in huge quantities. But we wanted to find out more about the scale of the problem. How much can a Trading Standards team seize in just one year? Near Bristol, there's a secret lock-up. Its contents? Highly valuable evidence in hundreds of court cases against some major crime gangs. Francis Chalk from Bristol Training Standards has agreed to let us in. So here we are in our warehouse. It's a secret location for the obvious reason that it's stuffed full of counterfeit goods. We've got counterfeits and fakes of every description. Clothes, shoes, we've got cosmetics, we've got cigarettes, there's alcohol, there's fake toothbrushes, there's fake razor blades. You name it, we've got a fake of it. Here, under one roof, are the spoils of a thriving industry in fake goods. Everything in here put together is worth well over a million pounds. We've taken a million pounds of fakes off the streets. £1 million worth of fakes seized in just one year. Many of them are a serious threat to public health. So what we've got here are fake GHD hair straighteners. They're one of the most popular items that we find faked. Quite often we find that these products either don't have fuses in them or the fuses that are in them are fake, which means that the plug will heat up, potentially burst into flames and these could cause a house fire. Fakers are increasingly looking at making money out of medicines, but with fake drugs, like this fake Viagra, there's no way of telling what you're actually putting in your body. The very unusual thing about this product, though, is it's got too much of the active ingredient in it. This can actually lead to severe health problems, like blindness, and can even cause a heart attack. There's been a huge increase in the number of people buying prescription medication online but patients can't be sure what they're getting, and that means they're taking serious risks with their health. Recently, an international operation to stop sellers of fake drugs resulted in 10,000 websites being taken down and 200 people arrested. There's been cases of fake diazepam in Scotland recently where two people have actually died. Trading standards also seized thousands of these fake razor blades shipped in from abroad and destined for unsuspecting shoppers in the UK. 
These are part of a consignment that was seized from customs up in Coventry. So a lot of the items that are coming in from overseas, such as uh, China, go into that hub and customs were looking specifically for these products and they found literally tens of thousands of them. The fakers have employed some clever tactics to get their stock past the customs officials. In this case, they shipped the fake Joe Malone toiletries into the country in boxes with other brand names on them in order to avoid detection. Once inside the UK, the fakers can then finish the job. They've come into the country in this box and what's happened is that in the UK, someone has then just taken a sticker and put it over the top to make this look like this. Fake cosmetics cost the beauty industry over £200 million a year. And when you take the fake goods industry as a whole, the figures are staggering. The fakes cost the UK economy at least £1.3 billion every year. Worldwide, the trade is estimated to be worth something like £1.5 trillion. And it's getting harder and harder to stop. Francis has been fighting the fakers for years, long enough to see how they've evolved. Years ago when I started, we were dealing with people in car boot sales, flogging dodgy DVDs out of the back of their vans and cars. They were really easy to spot. These days, it's virtually impossible. This storage facility is just one of many used by trading standards teams across the country to house their seizures. 150 miles away in Cornwall, there's another lockup full of yet more fakes. Trading Standards Officer Gary Webster is on hand to show us what his team has seized in the last year. This is a huge stack of goods that we, we seized recently. Fake car badges, fake toys, fake remote controls, all sorts of different products that were being sold on online marketplaces and they were being distributed throughout the world. We estimate there's in the region of 90,000 items that were seized. We reckon that it may have made the counterfeiters over £2 million. And obviously investigations are still ongoing into exactly the full extent of, of the supply chain. Fakers follow consumer trends closely and they're quick to react when a new design or gadget becomes popular with shoppers. There's a huge amount of fake products and the, the, the brands and the types of products are changing all the time to obviously keep up with the latest fashions and crazes. We see huge changes in, in the toys, what's, what's popular one month can soon go out of fashion and something else pops along. The fakers are also into their films. OK, so every time we see a new movie, obviously we see a real increase in the amount of fakes and fraudulent items that are on sale, particularly those that appeal to children. I have uh, some from the Despicable Me franchise and Disney's Frozen as well. Fake film merchandise has been found to be poorly made and potentially dangerous for children. As we've seen on Fake Britain, six-year-old Bethany Stodden was scarred for life after her cheek was sliced open by a fake Frozen wristband. And some fake branded clothes have been found to be highly flammable. As a father myself, you know, I'd be very keen to ensure that my children were, were, were safe in the clothing and stuff that I'd bought for them. Um, it, with fakes, you've got no guarantees of the production method, you don't know what materials they've used, and you really are putting your children's lives at risk if you buy, buy fakes. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye.